girl, real talk. This whole it's new year, time to reinvent myself trash is not the vibe for 2024. You can find someone who loves you for you, as you are. You don't need to read a stack of self-help books, only eat sad salads, or like start meditating at 5 a.m. to be ready for dating. So yeah, my advice is to download Bumble and find someone who embraces you the way you are right now. Let me know how it goes. The Green Door. Is it Las Vegas's most infamous sex club? Its reputation certainly precedes it, but how many of us actually know what goes on inside? Today on CityCast Las Vegas, we have former kink educator Gemini Stevens. She also runs a great food podcast and could be considered an all-around hedonist. She's going to give us a peek behind the green door, a rundown of other play spaces in the valley, and help us demystify Las Vegas's sex scene. It's Monday, January 22nd. I'm Sarah Lohman, and here's what Las Vegas is talking about. Gemini, always a pleasure. Hi, thanks for having me. You know, I need an explainer. I think a lot of us need an explainer. I know there are many <laughs> sex clubs, right? Like, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's beloved, but maybe misunderstood. Um, so I know there are many sex clubs in Las Vegas, but the Green Door is probably the most well-known. So if it's okay with you, we're just going to start there with the most familiar okay. one. Yeah, Can you walk absolutely. us through, like, what happens when you enter the Green Door? You know, it's it's a little bit different for everybody. Um, mm-hmm. So in preparation for this, I thought about my own experiences. I talked to some people who um, have visited more recently. And it's not... So I like what you said about how the reputation precedes it. Um, mm-hmm. a, it's a very touristy idea, too. Like, oh, I heard about the green door. Like when friends visit or people yeah. come for the first time. Like, oh, what about these sex clubs I've heard about? And, and how do I how do I work with this? They're all really simple. You go in, you, you have mm-hmm. ID, um, you know, certain ones charge. Uh, I don't know what Green Door is charging right now, but you would go in. Usually if it's a couple, it's a it's a lower price. If you're a single woman, it's usually free or really, really low priced. Mm-hmm. And if you're a guy, you're going to pay a premium, a single guy. Um, and the problem I've always had with the Green Door, and this isn't saying they're good, bad or ugly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just that if you were going there, especially if you were going with a partner, the whole idea was to either look for other people and maybe do some swinging Mm -hmm. or put on a little bit of an exhibition. Mm -hmm. And what has been happening is that I'm learning more and more from people who have been more recently is that it's not exactly a place you're going to go and meet people. You're going to go and you're going to go have sex. And, you know, if you're an exhibitionist, that's great. If you're a voyeur, it's great. Mm -hmm. But there's not a whole lot of actual swinging happening anymore. As one friend put it, you know, people just aren't DTF. Like they're not going there to find somebody. They are going to just experience the green door for what it is. Part of it is the name. Part of it is the reputation. Um, And uh, while people have had some success, you're either an exhibitionist or you're a voyeur. The, The middle ground there where you meet up with people isn't what it used to be. So it, uh, uh, you're blowing my mind already as, as <laughs> hearing that other things aren't being blown, I guess. So people are going <laughs> as couples to the sex club and maybe they're like playing with each other for to, to exhibit or to have someone watch, but they're not like meeting somebody else and having sex with them in, in the green door anymore. I mean, There's no sex in the sex club? Not as much. Yeah, not as much. And I want people to please reach out. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I've been reaching out to uh, former and current people in the kink scene, in the swinging scene. Um, My husband and I do not swing. We made that decision a long time ago. But uh, it's it's sounding like more and more friends are disappointed when they go in because they are absolutely looking to switch things up a little bit. Wow. Okay. Well, I have so many questions. Let's see if I can do them in a particular (laughs) order. Um, Can you just give us, uh, for listeners who might not know, can you give us a brief definition of what swinging is? Swinging is when you and your partner, um, you've made a conscious and consensual decision to bring somebody else into your sex life. Um, Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a one-off. 
We're not talking about open relationships. We're not necessarily talking about polyamory. Um, You can do it at home. You can do it with friends. You can do it. um, There are clubs around town that can do it. But the idea is, is that you're uh, either swapping partners or sharing. Um, It could be uh, almost like an orgy situation, uh, but it's usually people who are willing to, with their partner, go to a place or host people who want to not necessarily leave their partner out, but experience sex and sex acts with other people. The other thing is, is that swinging used to be, um, at least when I was more regular and then talking to some other friends, um, it would be couples or thruples, I think they call them now, um, going and meeting others and bringing people in. Um, Single women are called unicorns. Um, Couples love to bring in a single woman. Mm -hmm. Um, That explains the cheap price point for them to get in, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And as much as it's a trope and it's become sort of a joke, you know, oh, my husband and I are just, you know, looking for a third. The truth is, is that's how a lot of people get into it. It's very Mm -hmm. comforting. It's very comfortable. You know, uh, a, a guy may not feel threatened by another guy. Women are usually softer, both psychologically and, you know, a little bit easier to kind of just chill, figure out what you're doing, things like that. But um, specifically for the Green Door, I've heard really great things about how it's very welcoming. It's, you know, it's it's ready for everybody. I had a friend, um, like I said, she went in and unfortunately the the response was nobody's DTF. They just want to watch. So I was going to ask, too, uh, places like the Green Door aren't necessarily exclusively swinging clubs. Can you give us a little bit of the the layout of maybe of the Green Door, maybe in general? We are going to get into some of the other spaces here in Las Vegas. Um, I'm just going to be very broad because it's usually pretty typical. Um, They'll have spaces where people are generally getting to know each other. You could go in almost... Some places it's kind of like a reception room in some places where they're either built from regular homes or they're hosted in in private homes. Um, It's like a living area. It's super Mm. chill. You kind of get the lay of the land. Who's there? Who's, you know, kind of willing to do what you get an idea of what other people are looking for. You have those conversations. You find out if you vibe. And are there sort of like icebreakers, drinks, music, something like Absolutely, that? Absolutely. Yeah. Most, yeah. most places there's all, there's usually always music. If it's a private home, they may or may not have professional entertainment. Um, I know that the red rooster brings in um, professional entertainment and party and they have, you know, parties and things like that. Um, if it's a private home, you know, there might be music going and there might be alcohol served. Most clubs that have some sort of a membership and you, don't let that, if you're interested in swinging, don't let that like, oh my God, I have to sign up somewhere. You go to the door, you you pay the donation, you're a member. Um, that's usually how it works. Um, you can BYO, put your name and put your name on the bottle. They they will do the serving so they can mm-hmm. kind of gauge, uh, make sure they're not over serving people, things like that. Um, you don't just walk around with a bottle of, you know, whiskey right. or something like that. Right. Um But yeah, so there's music and there's like chill space and get to know each other's space. And then when you start to branch out and and you start to decide what kind of play you want to get into, you are talking about sometimes there's an open room where there's multiple spaces, surfaces, uh, places in a single room. Usually it's a fairly large room where multiple things can be happening at one time. You don't have to be involved in all of them. Um, it's just more of a shared space. Uh, there's also private rooms available, um, depending on the club. Sometimes they are ultra private and can have closed doors. A lot of places, things are still open so you can see what's going on, but there'll be what I call a soft boundary, maybe a chain you hold across the door or a rope or something like that. So people can still see what's going on, but you've made it clear that this is your space and no others are allowed in. Like a visual indicator. Yeah, says- it's a visual indicator of of some sort of privacy of, of saying, yeah, we're, we're full, we're good. You know, we've got all that we can handle in here right now, but it still gives you the option to, to negotiate. I mean, consent and negotiation are huge in all of these things. So whether you want to be an exhibitionist, whether you want to be a voyeur, whether you want to play with somebody, you know, as long as all of that is going on. Girl, real talk. This whole, it's a new year, time to reinvent myself trash is not the vibe for 2024. 
you can find someone who loves you for you, as you are. You don't need to read a stack of self-help books, only eat sad salads, or like start meditating at 5 a.m. to be ready for dating. So yeah, my advice is to download Bumble and find someone who embraces you the way you are right now. Let me know how it goes. So it sounds like, too, there's no pressure to participate. You can, you don't have to. You can just sort of show up and get the lay of the land. Yeah. Too. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, that's the intent. You know, yeah. unfortunately, there is a slight dark side um, and, and maybe more than slight. Mm. Um, they tend to be very cis heteronormative, um, Mm -hmm. which can sometimes be really uncomfortable for people. Um, You know, I consider myself pansexual. Um, Some people would just say queer. I think uh, I don't I don't think that because of how I present that I would I would borrow queer. Um, But there are places that you're not forced, of course, nobody can force Mm -hmm. you to do anything, Um, but you are encouraged And Mm -hmm. so there can be this sort of underlying, well, if you're not playing, why are you here kind of vibe. Um, I've had it happen to myself. I went to a private party and I was there with both a girlfriend and um, another friend. And it was very high pressure, Um, Mm. but with this sort of subtlety that made it like, oh, well, you know, if, if you don't want to, then, you know, mm-hmm. I'll just walk over here. But if if you walk in and somebody takes interest, um, there absolutely can be those points of pressure, those points of making you uncomfortable if you're the one not participating. Um, and that's the difficult side for me because you want it to be inclusive and, and inclusivity includes people's comfort level. I think, you know, inclusivity is a, is a great way to phrase it. Like what are some of the most inclusive spaces that you found here in the Valley? Uh, one of the most inclusive spaces that I have seen um, and hear about still, because like I said, I've, I've, you know, my husband and I are monogamous. We don't um, go to swingers clubs or anything like that together. Um, that came out wrong. It's not like we go separate either, but. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. You, you used to be a big part of the scene. You still have a lot of friends in the community. Yeah, you did some yeah. amazing and we intel still have a lot of friends us. in the community. Um, so Whispers is has a really great reputation for being inclusive. And that includes, you know, how you look, who you are, how you identify. Red Rooster is really good about putting it out on their website, but I haven't mm. talked to anybody that's been there recently, but they mm-hmm. make it very clear that we don't have a judging system when you walk in the door. We don't make sure that you're fit or pretty. Mm. Can you just tell us a little bit about those spaces? You mentioned Whispers. You, res- you mentioned Red Rooster. Um, yeah. So um, I haven't been to Red Rooster in a while, um, but I know for a fact that Whispers started out as a private home. I think it was a couple uh, on their website too, Mike and Chris. They started it in 1983 in a small house. They've now mm. made it into like this 12,000 square foot space. And it's full of all these different spaces we talked about, like private spaces and open spaces. And and um, they have some couples only spots, things like that. Um, Red Rooster, I believe, also started as a private home. It still has that sort of vibe. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first came onto the scene in Las Vegas in 20, oh gosh, 2008, 2009, Red Rooster tended to have an older clientele. Um, but now that I am older, I kind of understand it. Uh, but Whispers and the Green Door and the Red Rooster are are probably the three that I would I would talk about the most. Um, they've got decent reputations. They come off as very welcoming. So I also know from friends in the queer community that Club Kuma, which is it's uh, K U M A, which is a gay bathhouse, they also uh, have like an all genders night. I think once a month too. Um, I'm curious, do you know of other spaces for the queer community here in Vegas? Um, a, a friend of mine recently mentioned to me something called Vanta Black. And to be fair, I can't speak to it um, other than um, it is meant to be uh, a really inclusive space. Um, it is meant to be more open racially. Um, mm. Most of these clubs um, tend to lean towards cis heteronormativity. They mm. tend to be more white than anything else. Um, and so I really encourage people to look up what is available to them. Um, But my understanding is that, you know, they are kind of the 
touchstone right now for what inclusivity means and to bring in queer, bring in, um, you know, racially diverse um, players and make sure that everybody actually does feel inclusive because whether it's by design, which I don't believe um, is happening too much more nowadays. There was a time when I remember walking into places and yeah, basically if you weren't white and hetero, Mm. um, you were treated differently. Well, hetero, if you're male, not if you're female, right? That's the idea of the unicorn. Fair enough. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, the idea of the unicorn is that the woman would probably be, you know, down for anything. Yeah, yeah, that's the expectation, which is a very 90s view, a mainstream view of sexuality, mainstream view. Very very male. (laughs) It is. It's a very, yeah. And I hear the criticisms, too, that it can be very misogynist. It's it's a very, I I would even call it antiquated at this point. So um, I really just kind of want to hit on two more questions. Yes. So I'm sure people, too, are wondering about how do you stay safe? Like, are people using protection? You know, is there STI risk? What about your own, like, physical boundaries? Can you say a little bit about that? I can, yeah. Um, So I, it wasn't, consent was the biggest thing um, when I was more active. Talking to people now, um, safety is getting better. Um, Mm. But there are still like two classes of people. There's a class of people that walk in and they say, hey, I've been tested recently. Here's some information on me. Um, You know, these are all the tools that I have with me to be safe, whether it's condoms or dental dams or, you know, other other things. Oh, and actually like presenting their recent STD test, too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. There, there are people that almost walk in with a resume and say, you know, we, this is something that's very important to us. And so, you know, I, I use this phrase all the time, you know, as long as you're a safe, sane adult, you should be able to do whatever the hell you want to. I love that. I consider dating an application to my time. So I love someone applying to have sex right, with me. Exactly. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. We just need to have a set couple of questions. Um, and, but then I'm hearing as well that some people walk in and, you know, they'll use condoms, but not dental dams or, hmm. um, you know, there's still people out there that make excuse not to use either. And it happens um, across all genders. And it seems like the spaces are very consent heavy just in terms of, you know, uh, a constant asking of permission. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, And there are people sometimes, um, I've always called them, you know, or heard them called dungeon masters. Sometimes they're called play masters um, that walk around and just make sure that those conversations not specifically are happening. They don't sit you down and and have a class, but they want to make sure that the communication is open and clear and that people are feeling comfortable, that nobody is feeling pressured. Uh, There are places that will absolutely provide safety equipment. Um, Again, whether that's, you know, I'm pushing the condoms and the dental dams big because those are your first two easy tools to grab um, when you're going to be opening up your sex life and inviting other people in. Um, But there are things like spermicides. There are things Mm. um, like deciding, you know, that there are certain things you're just not going to do because there's no way to protect against it. So safety is a big issue, um, but there's a little bit less of that. Um, There's a level of almost incredulity when somebody asks for recent testing information. And they're not necessarily asking for the paper that so many people are willing to provide. They just Mm. want to have a conversation. When's the last time you got tested? Have you ever had an STI? What was it? How did you treat it? These should be really easy conversations to have. So it seems like A large spectrum um, with individuals definitely having different safety levels and boundaries, and it's an ongoing negotiation. Absolutely. At at, at every point. So going back to the beginning, you mentioned people coming here as tourists and being like, I've heard about these sex clubs. And the truth is they probably have these spaces in their own city, but maybe we sort of invite a sort of like a bad, you know, you can come here and be bad, right? Yeah. So my, you know, my last question here is why should Las Vegans care about these spaces? Why should they care, support, or appreciate these play spaces, even if they themselves don't participate? The reason having these places is super important, especially in a place like like Las Vegas, where people want to come and they want to visit and they want to, you know, kind of kick everything off to the wind and they want to be bad, so to speak, um, is that the cleaner, the safer, the more inclusive spaces that we have, 
the better that that experience is going to be for the people visiting. And it's and it's for locals as well. Um, if you feel that your community, and it should be a community, um, is there to take care of you and there to offer you a space where you can be wholly yourself, um, regardless of what you look like, regardless of race, regardless of how you identify, regardless of gender, those kinds of things make a stronger community and it makes it stronger because then people are willing to talk about it. Then people are willing to bring people into it. They're willing to have the harder conversations because they're in a space that absolutely promotes that kind of comfort, that kind of safety. Um, and if you don't have that, you end up with weird underground spaces. You end mm. up with these places that are not inclusive. You end up with places where people might get hurt. Um, you end up with places that just add to you know, the bad part of the sordidness when people talk about Las Vegas, right? We're all just a human trying to live a life that is interesting and fun and adventurous and, you know, welcomes every part of us and not just the parts that conform to something that looks good on a poster or, you know, um, sounds good on a soundbite. So the mm -hmm. more we have and welcome everybody from all walks of life to come and be absolutely comfortable and feel safe and be themselves, then we are just adding to what we can um, do for our tourists, for our locals, for everybody to so people can think of Vegas as a place that wants you here. That is so wonderful. Gemini, thank you so much for your insights. And I hope we can have you back some time to talk more, uh, talk more hedonism. Let's do it. I'm, I'm up anytime. Do you have thoughts on the Las Vegas sex club scene? Did we get it right? Did we get it wrong? Feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to hear your opinions. Text or call and leave us a voicemail at 702-514-0719. And that's all for today here on CityCast Las Vegas. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show? You know what? Send it to a friend that you want to gossip about this episode with. Leave us a review and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Take care.